the recording, go back to the screen share, <laughs> and then we should be able to get this to work. There we go. All right. So now, now we're officially recording. And it records a screen share. And as long as I have it on screen share and my face, it doesn't record your video. Um, it will record the chat session. So feel free to chat. And if there's questions in there that I didn't, you know, have an answer to anything, I can answer them to you um, later on, I guess. And uh, the it's actually downloaded as a TXT file. But kind of this is kind of how it's going to work is we will have these lectures. And then there's a few things I want to talk about throughout the semester. And they are in no particular order. I will talk to you about business rules and why it's so important that you understand what business rules are. It's, 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 it's common sense, but it saved me so many hours of anguish working with end users and bosses and bosses, bosses and the big boss and, the, and so on and so forth. Um, so business rules. I will tell you about HR dirty little secrets. I've got a whole portfolio that I've accumulated over the years. And I will be talking about um, manners, um, etiquette. You know, when you go out to a business meeting, uh, what, what's appropriate etiquette? Uh, how do you introduce yourself? What are, what are the things, you, what's, What's the common flow of a business dinner or a business lunch so you don't come across so nervous? I'll talk about interviewing techniques and typical questions you'll get. Um, nowadays, it's almost all based on your uh, competency. So you need your LinkedIn and your GitHub. That's what you really need for a job. Um, resume is only a dinky, dinky part of it. Um, not, it's not as big as it used to be. And let's see. And then I use Slack a lot. Um, Slack is what I'm going to be using for my uh, uh, communication vehicle for the most part. For example, I noticed there's only 16 of you in this class that are signed up to Slack that are actually registered in the 290 channel. Um, the reason I want you to use uh, Slack is there is a lot <laughs> of confusing changes going on at MJC right now. For example, if you show your VAX card and you upload your VAX card to the health, my health online, whatever it is at MJC, you're supposed to get a $250 bookstore credit for anything you want to spend it on, t-shirts, books, coffee cups, but it's not working quite right for classes that have textbooks that use an a platform that is not a hard copy textbook. So we're, there's still problems there. There's still problems getting people into classes. They changed how we add students. So that flow has changed. So a lot of those things I have started posting down here. In, well, let me move it over so you can see it. Now, can you see it, this Slack channel? No, no, you cannot see the Slack channel. Okay, that's good to know. So let, because what I'm doing is I'm sharing a screen and then I brought my Slack on top of the screen that I'm sharing. So what that says is it will only share the window that I have specified. Okay, so that's good to know. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, and let's see here. And yes, we will meet weekly at this time um, for the semester. And I will be arranging guest speakers. And some of them are actually gonna be some of my current students that are currently working in industry. And I said, hey, I need your expertise. Would you mind telling your story in 20 minutes or 30 minutes? And this is, this is an opportunity for you to talk to somebody who's in the industry and making money in tech and little tricks and techniques that they've learned over the years, okay? All right, all right. 
There we go. I keep the chat session open. And then I need the participant window open. So let me go back to do this, the share. I wonder if I can do this. Can I share an additional screen? Let's see what happens here. Oh, it, it changes. It looks like it just changes the share. Ah, yeah. So now it's Slack and you can see the Slack. Um, this a starting place is where I put the updates to things that I'm learning about. General, this is some interesting things that I've uh, picked up. Like for example, this little uh, picture is, if you're like me, you got email accounts all over the world and you don't want to manage yet another one. This is a way to forward all your, your Yosemite email to some external email address, okay? F's if you want to. And random is simply for fun. Okay, you know, got silly jokes here. Um, and then 290 will be stuff that'll be course specific. Okay, so you just register for those channels and hop on in. If you didn't get the invite, uh, let me know. I'll send it out again. Um, you should have it in your email box. Your The only email addresses that I have access to that are easily accessible are the ones in that have the my.yosemite.edu. Um, I can get to your preferred email, but there's no easy way for me to extract those and send it to a bunch of people, okay? So, all right. Now, the goal of this class is for you to make an awesome project. This is the only time in your career where you will be able to fail with impunity and still get an A, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so I've had a few students that did a crash and burn, but they still got their A because they learned so much. That's not true in industry. You sign up for a big project and it fails <laughs> you're you're updating your resume okay that's just kind of the way it goes okay all right now uh let's see here all right so last semester when i taught this class um it was really hard to mitigate projects when you never get a chance to see each other face to face, okay? I will break you into groups of two or three, no more than three. Um, and then if you choose to do a um, group project, that's fine. Um, I would encourage it because that is an interview question. That is a... <laughs> life skill that is how you succeed in this business is play well with others the days of the lone tech working in the dark of night those days are gone um you don't do that anymore it's just too complex um even cybersecurity, you're going to have five or six people and you're all going to be working crazy hours and you're all going to be working around the globe probably because you have an entire nation like Russia and China attacking your company, one person can't do it, okay? So it's, it's, it's gotten to be really interesting. And don't kid yourself, we're doing the same thing to them. So that's just kind of how it works, okay? I do wanna mention this ACM, uh, especially for this class. The ACM stands for the Association of Computing Machinery and for 19 bucks a year, you get access to so much awesome stuff, your brain will melt, okay? So what I'm going to do is just hop in and I'm going to log in. I will admit this website needs help. Um, so when you, once you register for your $19, it's kind of a bunch of hoop jumping once you join. But when you go to O'Reilly, Notice you get another sign-in account. You have to create something called a web account 
once you log in, you create this web account, that creates the credentials at ACM. Those credentials get handed off to O'Reilly, Skillsoft, and Science Direct that allow you to log in, okay? And I want you to notice how much you can get here. Let me shrink this down a little bit for $19. This is just one of them. What do you want to search on? How about um, JavaScript? Only 18,000 references. And these are classes, books, playlists, videos, all set out. You want to learn about, oh, let's say, let's learn about um, AWS. 11,000 for AWS. This is what, you know, the job skills right now are in uh, the cloud. And you can't go to school for cloud. You can get a certification called Cloud Plus that says, yeah, I'm a newbie. That's all it says. <laughs> you might be able to get an interview, but you're, you won't get a senior architect position. That's for sure. Um, this stuff is moving really fast. Um, let's learn about Docker. And this is just O'Reilly, okay? There's 11,000 things on Docker. <laughs> So as you can see, for $19 a year, you get this curated content, okay? So you can actually understand what it is you need to learn. And I, you know, Nathaniel was in my Linux class and I, I see his uh, uh, thing about Docker. Yeah, I, I, I can agree, but I can also understand the business use case. <laughs> the, the big thing right now is Kubernetes. It's... Uh, I wonder if they let you do it. Yep, K8s. So there's 2,000 references on Kubernetes. And um, this is, Kubernetes is non-trivial. You have to know a lot before you even start with Kubernetes, okay? Um, the, the Kubernetes, you can, what Kubernetes, the, the sweet spot for Kubernetes is if I was to describe it, um, let me, let me experiment with a drawing on the whiteboard. So let me go the other way here. All right. And you have to shout or something. Let me know if you can hear me and if you can see it. I'm going to try to draw the picture big enough. Okay. All right. So if this is K8, which would, that's how you pronounce, that's how you spell Kubernetes because most people can't spell it. It's this, I think it's the name of some Hindu God or something, I don't remember. But if you build your platform on Kubernetes, I don't care what you build, you can use your Docker containers, uh, you can use Vagrant. Now, Vagrant is a VM virtual machine manager. Uh, Vagrant is an open source version of the ESXi, kind of, sort of, but not quite. Um, it allows you to take your VMs that you've created in KVM or, or QMU to, so you can actually distribute them out, move, move them wherever you want. Um, you can put Docker and all this stuff on top of Kubernetes, but then there's a, a layer on this right in here that goes between these. One of them is Linkerd, and then there's etcd, and there's a couple others in this space. This stuff is non-trivial, folks. It's complicated. And the only way to get in there and learn it is to get in there and learn it. Blow stuff up. That's what this class is about. You get a chance to literally blow stuff up. Can you see that? Or is that, you can, you can see it? Okay. Um, so what happens is Kubernetes allows you, once you get it built and you've built it according to the Kubernetes spec, okay? Google created this. It allows you to move your entire workspace to AWS, Azure, or the Google Cloud. K8 
Can you see why people want this? Hey, AWS is getting too expensive. We need to roll it to Azure. Oh, guess what? We can roll it between these three things. Oh, guess what? AWS has a special on storage. Google has a special on compute. You can break your Kubernetes clusters up to go where you want them to. Are you lost yet? <laughs> yeah, that's why this stuff is so, um, that's why it's hard to find people that really know this stuff. If anybody says they got 10 years of Kubernetes, they're lying. Um, it hasn't been around that long, unless they actually work for Google, maybe they did. Um, but this, this area is rich and this is DevOps to the max, okay? And that, that's kind of my history as I built out stuff um, and I made it, made it stable for everybody else. And then they did their work. And the type of programming I did was system level uh, interfaces. Um, I didn't do a lot of end user reporting. Uh, one, I didn't like it because I was never done. Users are never happy. Can you imagine that? Okay, that's the ACM. Let me hit, okay, hit close here. All right, so let me go here and go to where I was. Uh, 290, 290 labs. It's like, now, one of the things I will be doing for you folks is that once we get through census, which is through the first two weeks, I will create an account for you on the Jeremy Michael Kelly Linux Unix box. And what that allows you to do is play around on a Unix machine without having to provision it first. Okay. And if you, if you really know this stuff, um, the, uh, I just ask you to be kind, um, because if you interfere with somebody else's learning, I do not take kindly to that. I, uh, I have been known to fail people over such things. The, as I is use your expertise to help somebody. Don't use your expertise to annoy other people. Okay. All right. So that's, that's kind of a play well with others type of thing. Okay, and there's a book that I have you read. It's a really simple book. It was written by Brian Larson. He used to teach here, and then he he started out life as a uh, as a English major, and he realized he wasn't going to make any money. And what he did is he went back to school and got his master's in computer science. And he'd been writing his whole career on and off, and then. I don't know, five or six years ago, he started writing science fiction full time and uh, he quit because <laughs> he's making more money writing science fiction. He, his science fiction stuff is what you call, it's a military sci-fi. So it, B.V. Larson, if you look him up, his stuff is fun. His book that you're going to read, you can find on Amazon for, I think, nine bucks, five bucks. It's a very fast read. It's dated. When you read through it, he's talking about the technology of the 90s. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the problems are people. And those problems have not changed. <laughs> so even though the content and the stories is around technology that's old and obsolete, the human factors have not changed. Okay. And one of the things in his book um, is, I, I love the chapter, if I can uh, find it. Let's see what he calls it. Yeah. He calls it the college degree excuse. Okay. I, I can learn this stuff without any uh, college degree. His advice is get it. Just get it and get it out of the way. Here's what I can tell you. I've had students in my classes that in certain areas know more than I do. They cannot get a promotion at their current employ 
because they do not have a degree. The degree is how you get through that ceiling to get into management. Why is that? Well, because most of management has a degree and they want other people to have a degree. It's a human factor. And I, it is a requirement for the course and I believe the bookstore has it and you can get it through Amazon either way. Um, I've been using it for several years now, so it's, it sh you should be able to find it, a copy of it for pennies, okay? Um, now, uh, the, if any of you have managed to get the voucher $250 and then use it to purchase a textbook and you had success, let me know. <laughs> because I cannot get it to work for the ZY books that I'm using in my programming class. It looks like it's gonna work for test out and uh, for networking and um, Linux, I think, okay? So we're gonna have to work together to figure that one out because we have a new bookstore company. Barnes and Noble is now running our bookstore. Um, so we have yet another new system to learn um, and this has been uh, complex for a lot of people, okay? All right, and let's see. The other, one of the other topics will be, and the book review is a really simple. You read one third of it, and I don't want a term paper. I want ideas and techniques that you think is going to help you get your job. So I want this to be completely opinionated Okay, I do not want this to be, you know, academic stuff. Okay, I want this to be pragmatic. How do I get a job? How do I keep the job? Okay. Um, uh, maybe I'll just talk about it now. I have worked with people that were so good in an interview that you wanted to hire them, but then you ask them a, a specific technical question like on AIX, it uses something called an ODM, which is an object data management store. It's kind of like the registry in Windows. Um, and they said, mm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm sure I can collaborate and we can figure that out. I'm going, dude, you're applying for an AIX position and you don't even know what the ODM is? You're brain dead, sorry. You're really convincing in the interview, but you don't know anything if you don't know that very simple thing. It's the kind of the, if it's the guts of AIX, you know, you gotta know it to make AIX work. <laughs> so it's like, hmm, okay. Um, so do you wanna come across in an interview like you know what you're doing? And then if you don't know, it's okay to say, I don't know, okay? So it's this business you will learn and forget so much stuff. It's crazy how much you learn and how much you forget on a yearly, weekly basis. Okay. All right. Now, um, the other thing I'll be talking a little bit about is project management. I was reading about the top 10 jobs in IT right now. Guess what's number one? Project management. Project management, I am a certified project manager, and that was the toughest certification I took. And um, I actually um, decided to contact the uh, Project Management Institute and say, hey, I don't want my credential to expire, but can I say I'm retired? And they said, yeah, you can do that for a fee and I said okay fine I'll pay the fee <laughs> so what this allows me to do is that if I want to I can send them a message saying hey I want to get back into the game and I can get back into the job of doing a project management because I'm certified this uh, PMP professional is it's a tough certification to get and then I'll talk about it in uh, later on in a, in a lecture um, about what it takes to become one and some of my, I've got 
literally, I got a three ring binder full of certifications. Um, they go way back, way, way back to the dark ages of computing. And um, this one's fun. I'm a Microsoft certified professional. Guess what? In Windows 3.11. That was probably before some of you were even born. <laughs> and then this SCO is the equivalent of the top of the line Red Hat certification. Well, SEO isn't in business anymore, but everything I learned there works today. So, you know, and IBM certified specialist in AIX. So yeah, I'm kind of a Unix Linux person. This is why you're taking this class. You wanna fail fast, but you wanna learn faster, but you wanna know why you failed, okay? If you can't solve the, the root cause, you're gonna fail again. And in this area, I'll give you this one thing right now. I'm going to put this um, in my notes here because I'm kind of keeping track of what I'm talking about. Um, there's something called the five whys. Why, 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 why. This is something that you will find is very effective, extremely effective in finding root causes in technical issues. However, if you use the five whys against somebody who doesn't know what that's about, they're going to get really irritated at you and probably take a swing at you. <laughs> Okay, so you just, you have to kind of level the playing field and say, I'm gonna, we're going to go through this exercise and we're gonna ask why several times and we're gonna keep pulling back the covers until we find root cause. It doesn't work, why? Well, I just installed some new software. Oh, why? Because I was solving this other problem. And then you start asking why, and you get back to the root cause. And you're going, aha, we can solve this problem now. Because a lot of times you'll just get, especially if you work in help desk, you get this all the time. I clicked on this and it doesn't work. And that's all they say. They expect you to know where you're coming from. That, that's just the way life is. It's tough. But five whys is extremely useful. Hey, my code didn't work. Why? Okay. What did I miss? Did I miss a semicolon? Did I miss an indent? Did I, why? So it's okay to ask why lots of times. And in tech, there's always 10 right answers. And there's no such thing as one, only, one and only one right answer. That's, that's true in math, because math is very precise. Uh, but in technology, since you have, if you're trying to map this discrete structures onto human behavior, it's never a clean map, okay? So there's 10 right answers to any tech problem. All right. Now, next week, what I will do is I'm going to give you a show and tell of old hardware. And I'm going to kind of, because I have the, the camera and I'll be able to show most of it. Some of the smaller things I won't be able to show you, but Maybe we can play some games with our document camera here that I have in front of me. I'll have to experiment. This technology that I'm using is all new. I'm using a wireless mic. I'm using a very old webcam um, and it, it's got a built-in zoom. Um, it's actually a video recorder that works as a webcam. And so I'm experimenting with trying to do this from the classroom. Uh, because in the networking class, I want to be able to get people on campus so we can actually build cables, okay? Physical hands-on something. Because uh, you have to know how to build a cable as a network engineer. <laughs> and people don't know how to use their hands because you don't have a need for it anymore. Like how many can fix their own car or fix a doorknob or, or a refrigerator? You know, most people can't do that any. Fix their own plumbing. Uh, okay. All right, got that, that, that. All right, so where I'm coming from, yeah, I've got two master's degrees. Uh, my AA is from here in music. And 
I don't do much music anymore because I've lost a lot of my hearing and I listen to songs that I played or I hear music that I was a part of. It just doesn't sound the same. So that's part of the reason I like listening to weird stuff like nature sounds and other interesting things. Okay. All right. Now, what are you going to do? You are basically in the beginning, we're going to break into teams and find out if you want to work in teams. I have no problem with you doing your own project by yourself. But the chances of success doing it all by yourself is much smaller. Um, and what happens when you do a project by yourself? You don't learn as much because you don't get to tap into the expertise of the person next to you. And if you're both struggling on the same thing, you're gonna be learning at a faster rate, okay? I recommend it highly that you do that, but I'm not, making, I'm not forcing you into it because I realize that it's hard to get together in this, this COVID area, COVID timeframe. And sometimes it's just hard to connect because you may be in different counties, you know, uh, it just might be hard to, to meet. But what we're going to try to do is create a box for your project. And that box, we want to finish your project within the semester. And then what you want to do with this project is write it up to make it look like it's the gold standard. So you can post it on GitHub on how you did it all the steps you took, um, all the things that you've done, um, the things that didn't work and how you remediated it and how you fixed it. Employers want to see how you learn. And by demonstrating your failures and your recovery from failures is a phenomenal way in a non-threatening way to show an employer that you've got the stick to the tenacity to solve the problem. Because to be really good in this technology, to be in, in tech in general, you do not need to be a genius. The number of people I know in this business that are bipolar, dyslexic, ADD, <laughs> OCD, <laughs> it's just, it, we seem to attract those types, <laughs> which is fine. I'm dyslexic myself. I was labeled mentally retarded in, in grade school. So that wasn't true. Um, but you don't know when you're that age. So the, the process of trying to work through this stuff, what it takes to be good is two things. Curiosity and tenacity. If you are not curious, how something works, you're going to start getting frustrated. And I would put in there that tenacity, because there, there is, when you're working in code, you can be working on a soul crushing bug for days. And when you finally get it, you get this, yes! And I've been doing this for a long time. And guess what? That feeling really never goes away. <laughs> All right. So those are the two things. You don't need to be smart. You need to be curious, passionately curious, and have a lot of tenacity. Just stick with it. And so when we create our, our project, and if you need ideas, let me know. I, I've got gazillions of ideas. Um, to start with the Raspberry Pi and the Makerspace, if you have not looked into Maker Mag Magazine, I don't want to go to ads. I want to go down to the actual. Yeah, let's go to the community here. They put out a magazine, but you don't need a magazine, but they have all kinds of things for you to build and they all all kinds of things um some things are fun um they have kits 
uh, let's go to the magazine and I'll show you some of this stuff in Make Magazine. So they have the different boards. Uh, cosplay is a big thing in uh, the maker scene where you use 3D printers to print your costumes and you can make your costumes light up, how to do robots, electronics, stuff you can do with the Raspberry Pi. And it just goes on and on and on and on of what you can do with this stuff. And how they made a, uh, this was a, a face mask that they did some printing to help protect um, frontline workers. Um, pretty amazing. Um, but this is just a start. So you need, I've had students build a um, garage door opener checker. So they would use the Raspberry Pi and a bunch of layered software, and they created an app on their phone so they could actually see if their garage door was up or down. And they would hit a button and the garage door would go down. Yeah, you can buy software to do all that, but sometimes it's more fun to build it yourself. The, uh, I had another person build an, an automated um, pet food feeder that uh, from a distance they, they could control how much food their, their dog got and they could hit a button and it would dispense a few things. And one of the more interesting ones I was, I saw was a, you know, the, uh, the button that says that's easy for an office depot or whoever, um, they, they modified that. So when a dog would come up and step on it, they'd get a treat and it would take a picture and post it to Twitter. So they would do an automatic process of taking a picture and then put it up on the, on the web. So stuff like that, okay? All right. Now, it can be anything. It can be, hey, I want to learn Docker. And then you go through the process of building a project to Docker. Or, hey, I need to learn Kubernetes. What's the process of learning Kubernetes? How do you build it? What do you need? Um, hey, I want to build my own private cloud. We can do that too. We have the facilities, so we have the capability. If you want to use server space and rack space, we can do that. Okay. Hey, I want to build my own website from the ground up. I want to use a Linux box. I want to load Apache. I want to load PHP. I want to use JavaScript. <clears throat> I want to set up a mail server. I want to set up DNS. You can do all that. Okay. Uh, you can do that on the on our machines here and my website at philipsd.com runs on linode or linode as i found out okay this is five dollars a month and you get your own linux box to do whatever you want with it okay if you want to make it for um set it up for honeypots, you can do that. I use it for my static website generation. I use it for my vanity plate. And it took me several years on the wait list to get to philipsd.com because somebody had it and it was like a, a somebody set up some pictures and it stayed there for two or three years and nobody did anything with it. So when it finally expired, I jumped on it. Domain squatting, as they say. And then it became my domain. And then I paid for it for the next you know, I don't know, 42 years. So when I'm dead, somebody else can have it, okay? Other things that we'll be doing is once we, this is in the process of changing right now, this free VMware, <clears throat> we have a limit now. We have a limit, I think, of 405 people that can get VMware. So I don't know if this is going to work for us as a discipline or if we're going to need a different tool like VirtualBox, which is free, um, or we could use QMU, we can use KVM, we can use Zen. There's other open source alternatives to this, but the VMware is a job skill because Gallo has a big installation. Foster's has a gig, big installation. Um, you know, Datapath has a huge uh, VMware installation. 
So it is a job skill. So I'm working with my peer group to find out how we're going to do this. But there's been so many changes this semester. So this is another thing that's changed. I'm not exactly sure how it's going, what the end result will look like. But in the meantime, I believe I think this is free and VMware player is, yeah. All right. This may be what we end up evolving to is using this um, because it's enough. Okay. It's not great, but it's enough to be familiar with how it works. Okay, so you've got it for Windows, Linux. This may be what we end up having to go to is the just the free version of the VMware player because the old version of player, you could not author a virtual machine. The new versions, you can. So play with it and let me know what you think and tell me if you think it's gonna work. Because if you can create a virtual machine, let's say you create two or three virtual machines, you can create a little network and they all talk to each other and it works, that's all the more we're going to need uh, for this class or any class. Okay. So this may be what we have to do is use the player. We'll see. Okay. Stay tuned. All right. And in the other classes, this class also um, <clears throat> what you will have access to is the Jupyter Notebook. Some of you may have had access HTTPS to this already. This is a machine that's over there. It has an external facing IP address to one of the bridges. Um, so there's an external IP address, only a very few ports open to get in. Um, so you can get in and, but anyway, what happens is <clears throat> you may not have need for the Jupyter Notebook, but as somebody that's been around and kind of knows stuff, this is a phenomenal tool because it is changed the way, um, data science is being done okay you can author it like right now i can say i want to create a new let's go with a new i have one right now python 3. it supports i think 40 different programming languages you can do this in ruby r julia octave all these data science languages <clears throat> and it, you can also use COBOL if you want and other such languages. And you can use it for a text file. You can just make a simple text file. You can create a folder. And then this is why I use it. Terminal, yay. I don't have to teach you about putty. I don't have to teach you about opening a tunnel on your SSH. I don't have to worry about your client working. All you need is a web browser and I can get you to a terminal on a Linux box, okay? Then I can start teaching you anything you wanna learn about the Linux box, okay? So that happens around week two after we get through census um, and the roles kind of stabilize. Um, I'll go through and create an account for you and it'll be the first part of your uh, my.yosemite.edu website or email. And then I'll send you instructions on how to log in and how to play with this and how to tinker with it. And I'm using something called the Jupyter Hub that puts a proxy around the Jupyter Notebook. Okay. So it, it gives it the ability to be multi-user, so to speak. The Jupyter Notebook is designed to be on a machine for one person. You save your notebook and all everything you need it and you send it to somebody else. And I like using the, the notebook 
<clears throat> to explain this markdown. Markdown is a way of implementing language. So it, think of it as a simple way to format your text. And you're going, why do I need to learn this? Documentation. I don't care what you do in this business, you're gonna to have to learn how to do, do documentation. And there is um, all kinds of stuff to learn. GitHub Pages allows you to host your own website, providing you put it in Markdown and then you just load it up and it renders it for you. You can apply themes to it and it makes it all pretty. And that's what I'm doing here. I have a static website that I generate Markdown, and then it runs through a bunch of Python scripts and sets up the cascading style sheet and the pretty fonts. Boom, done. So all I do is basically use a text file, put my Markdown text in there, render my static web page, and I look like I know what I'm doing. Okay. All right. So that's important. And when we're done with this class, you will have a project and you will be giving a demo about your project. You'll have lessons learned and um, what you would do differently, knowing what you know now. You know, those are the types of questions you'll ask yourself at the end of this. And then when I get in the guest speakers, um, this is where it would be helpful to the guest speaker to have your camera on. Okay, so they don't feel like they're talking into empty space. Okay, and I'll make that request at the beginning of the class. Okay, um, so uh, I've had guest speakers from all over the map um, over the years, and um, some of them I take notes on all the guest speakers, and I have learned so much <laughs> since I've been putting on this class. I go. Oh, that's a brilliant idea. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> um, and then in, in college, one of the things that if you're, let's say you're majoring in uh, computer engineering or not computer engineering, software engineering, or you're going to be a programmer, you want to be a web dev, um, you're going to hear in academia, you got to comment your code. You got to comment your code. And you ask these professional people that do this, they said, no, you never comment your code. You comment the ticketing system. Big difference. So it, it's like I worked with people throughout my career that said, if you write your code well enough, you shouldn't need to document it because it would be self-evident and clear. Um, when Guido, the inventor of Python, got a job at <coughs> Dropbox, he spent a lot of his time training their engineers not to be so clever. You don't have to prove how smart you are. You're writing this code for the next person. You want to make it clear and unambiguous, unambigu <laughs> ambiguity, and unambiguous. There's the word I was looking for. <laughs> okay. You never write code for the computer anymore. You write code for the next programmer that just got to take care of it. And then when you comment your code, you want to comment when you're doing something silly, stupid, hacky. Like, hey, I shouldn't do it this way, but I don't have time. This is what it's supposed to do. Warning, it may not work as advertised. Dragons be hiding, you know, or something like that. You put that in the code and you let the guy behind you know that I may have screwed up, but it's working right now. There was a, a fellow I followed when I was doing more database programming. I fired up this um, initialization script and all it did was it said 300 lines of can't. That's all it said. Can't, 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 can't. I could not figure out what was wrong. I wanted to strangle the guy. And it was, it was, <laughs> uh, it was so irritating. 
But when I finally figured out what the problem was, I changed the code and I commented very clearly of what happened. And one of the things that you'll learn, um, I worked with this, uh, I actually had him come in twice. He was a PhD from Oxford. And how he ended up in the Central Valley, I don't know. And, uh, but he had actually, his company was in Fresno. They allowed him to work remote and his wife's family was in the area. They had long since flown from the area, but he told me something that I thought was very insightful. Anytime you open code in your editor, make it better. Even if it's just clarifying the comments, make it better. And I said, you know what? That's a really good approach because if you touch anything and you make it just a snidge better, eventually you're going to have less and less bugs in the future. But he was a software engineer of the highest caliber. And I figured if he's saying this, this is important because he actually wrote code that created chips. And then they had these very specific chips that he would actually design all the code for to do very specific things. Um, it was very interesting what he was doing. Okay. So that's the big picture of the project of projects class, final projects. This is more of a laid back class. Okay. So um, when I do the uh, uh, old hardware lecture, um, that'll be recorded. And then <laughs> What I want you to do is I have a few lectures I do throughout the semester, not very many, um, but what I want you to do is practice taking notes, okay? Now the notes that you take are for you. What did you, if when I say something or you know I, I bring out a topic, just it may be new to you, and it may be interesting to you, that's something you want to take a note on. But if you've been doing this, whatever it is, if you've been involved with HR for 30 years, and I mentioned something about HR that you just know about, you don't need to take notes on that. Does that make sense? I want you to take notes on your skills gaps, not what you know. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's kind of how we'll do things. All right. So they so we'll have HR dirty secrets, manners, business rules, project management, and in the manners and stuff will be the um, thank you note. And um, I have a here. Let me ask this question. I'm on Slack right now. I'm in two ninety. Let's see if I can do this. Maybe I can do it in, now well, let's try this. <clears throat> All right. And let's see how I can do this. Where's my controls? Here we go, polls, here we go. Here, we'll just, I'll just do it right here. I think this will work. All right, this will be really, really simple. I'm gonna do it from inside Zoom here because it looks like it'll work. Um, and my question is really simple. How many grew up writing thank you notes, like to grandma for Christmas presents? And we'll be, you can simply say, um, yes or no. Yes, no, or sometimes, maybe I'll do that. 
add choice sometimes. Save. <clears throat> OK. Now, how do I turn the poll on? <laughs> Okay. Now, if I go to I've created it. Oh, there we go. Launch. Okay. You should have it in Zoom now. It says untitled advanced poll. So go ahead and just say yes, no, or sometimes. This is anonymous, so I don't have any idea who you are. Um, well, that was pretty easy. I've never done that before. That's kind of cool. So we have a of 22 people, and I think there's 29, 28 people in the class. I had a few folks tell me they wouldn't be here tonight, which is part of the reason we're requiring. Now, notice that we have yes, no, sometimes. See, can you see the answers? Did the poll come? So you can see this one. This screen shows? No, it doesn't. Okay, let me stop the share, move it to here, and do share, and go here. Then go there. There. That's the results. Now, can you see it? Can you see the results? Yes? No? I'm assuming you can see it. Uh, we can see yeah, it. Okay. I just don't know where the uh, results are. Good. Awesome. Now, this the reason I ask a question about thank you notes is a lesson that I learned in industry. Um, here's, here's a true story. I was on sabbatical, maybe about right, you know, the semester, about a semester, year before COVID hit. And I traveled around different colleges and I talked to them about their cyber programs. And I just said, hey, what are you doing? How do you do it? Um, how do you, what, what's going on here? Uh, needless to say, they're about light years ahead of where we are um, in our cyber program. And then I wrote them a thank you note. And then I included my contact information. And it was very interesting to get the feedback from these people, these other professors, PhD people from four-year institutions. Wow, a hard copy thank you note. I haven't seen one of those in years. And they were very appreciative of it. Um, there's never underestimate the power of a handwritten note, especially when it's personal. Okay. For example, I was in the habit of taking, when I got a new boss, which happened frequently throughout my career, I would say, let's set up a lunch date. I will take you to lunch. I don't want to talk business. I just want to hear your story. And I just want you to hear my story. And they always said yes, because it's the human factors, right? That's what humans are human. So we'd go out to lunch and then I'd, you know, do the etiquette thing. And then I'd wait at the end and I would reach for the bill and they would almost always take it away from me. So they paid for lunch, even though it was my invite. The way it works in business lunch is if you invite somebody to a business lunch, you pay. That's an unspoken etiquette, okay? So I always had this one, I worked with this one consultant who would always invite us to lunch. And he said, oh man, I left my wallet in the office. You slime. <laughs> he did it on purpose. <laughs> It was amusing, but nevertheless, um, a, but the, the folks, when I, after I would take my bosses out to lunch, 
I'd write them a heartfelt uh, thank you and say, thanks for your opportunity to you know, share your story. I understand where you're coming from. I can, I really respect your vision that you have for our department and so on and so forth. And guess what happened when riff time came around? I never got riffed because I was a human, not a name. Now you can call it whatever you want to call it. Some people called it brown nosing. I said, no, it's called survival. <laughs> and it's also a lot easier to work with people when you know their backstory. It makes more sense. You're going, oh, now I know why you have a slant towards this. That's your background. Okay. All right. Why do you always buy IBM? Oh, I understand now. So it's helpful to understand their, where somebody's coming from, because then you can kind of, once you understand their motives and things, you can kind of predict where things are going. And then that's when you can say, hey, I need to update my resume and get out of Dodge, okay? Because there's another crappy job waiting for you. That's a given, okay? All right. All right, as far as the syllabus, uh, that's, let me go over here. It's like, and I'll just open it up here. This is super simple. Um, it's called statement of work. And it's basically up for one reason, subject to change. <laughs> That's the only thing I really need in my syllabus is because things change from week to week about how process goes, okay? And um, then I basically have other things going on with other types of things. Um, all right, so there's some links that are in the shell that you, this is some of those links and you've probably looked at those. And that one, the etiquette edge is, um, worth your time to read it it talks about standard business etiquette um and we'll talk a little bit more about that i i will do a combination lecture of hr and etiquette and thank you notes one night and then <clears throat> on another night i'll do a the business rules project management thing okay um so i don't have a lot of um lectures for this i try to line up guest speakers okay and we've had a lot of different speakers over the over the years um i may bring in another professor um we'll see how things go okay all right so the poll worked really well in zoom i've got this thing in zoom that allows me to do polls but it are Slack that allows me to connect to polls. And I will be using Slack for office hours. So if you need anything during office hours, and um, most of you under, if, if Slack is new to you, that's good, that's fine. Um, but Slack is a, is a tool that you will be using in industry. It'd be something similar or it may mutate. Uh, I know if you're a gamer, a lot of folks, folks like to use Discord. Um, because it's a little better with um, the audio thing for headsets, multi-user. Slack is for business, and um, it's it's got some tight integrations to Zoom. So let's say, for example, we show up at an office hour, and you've got an honest question. I can hit slash Zoom, open up a Zoom meeting, and then you then you're automatically connected to it. And then I, you can do a screen share to me and I can see what the problem is you're doing or something like that. So in that respect, Zoom and Slack can make life a lot easier when you need to see somebody else's computer to help them solve the problem, okay? Not so much in this class, um, but in other classes, that's, that's true, okay? Well, <clears throat> that's about all I had. So what I wanna do now is just open it up for questions um, and I'll stop the screen share.
and you can ask questions away. Well, all these websites, AMC, JMK, Advice Funnel Projects, uh, be on the website, sort of, kind of. Um, this is, we're breaking up into groups uh, so you can brainstorm some ideas, uh, will be very helpful for you, okay? So there's 30 people. So that means we got everybody in class. To, that's good. Glad everybody's here. If you're not on Slack, get on Slack. But then once I break you into groups, you can talk to each other on Slack. I find Slack to be a lot easier to read and do a quick message than it is to do email or the Canvas discussions or the messaging inside Canvas, which just goes to your email. Um, Slack is a great way to do, um, think of it as a, the convenience of a phone call without having to worry about, you know, anything. I, I find it very useful, okay? Because then I can answer it from my phone, I can answer it from my computer, or I'm on another computer or another computer because I roam between computers and I got Slack installed all of them. So I can actually, you know, check it wherever. So it comes in really handy. Okay. All right. So questions, fire away. What chapters of the book do we need next week? Good question. Let me turn the share back on. Yes, this one, share, and let's go to here. And when I go to my main website, I've got this Canvas link. It's also on the web website, okay? Oh, future reference, you probably don't care about, but this is a piece of trivia. I also have an email address. It's philipsd at mjc.edu. mjc.edu is aliased to Yosemite. For the most part, you can get a hold of me either way. Okay. It doesn't give me too much heartburn, except on certain websites that do domain author uh, validation. Whoops. Use the right password. Well, come on. Would help if I could spell my own name right. Now, what I recommend is if you got the time, read the book and do all the book reviews and get it done. Okay. So, book review part one isn't due until February 2nd. Okay. So, and I'm asking you to submit a PDF so you can learn how to do that. You can be in Word, LibreOffice. I don't know how to do it on a Mac. I don't own a Mac, um, but I use um, on my Linux box, I, I use, um, I can use a text file and I can print a PDF and upload a PDF. <laughs> so I, I have a PDF printer. I don't care what the format is. Um, it's I have found that Canvas renders PDFs much faster than Word documents. Uh, Word documents, it seems to take a forever to render them. Um, it's getting better, um, but submitting a PDF just makes it uh, easier for me to go through and grade, okay? And so you're basically just gonna read it and then do your comments on it. So. You can do all three of them, post them whenever, you know, whatever works for you. So there's no big rush on getting it done. Those are the only ones that are open right now. Um, the other ones aren't, I haven't published yet. I've got to line up some speakers. I've got a few lined up. I think um, they haven't confirmed, but we'll see. So questions. Go back to chat here. The review is very simple. What did you get out of it? What advice 
makes sense to you. I actually had one person do a, a, a very, she was an English major. <laughs> and if you watch the Jeremy movie, she was, she was the speaker um, for the, the main character, if you want to call it that, the main spokesperson for the Jeremy lab. She had her degree, I think her master's degree in English, and she did a phenomenal book review. <laughs> and she told about all the things that were wrong with the book and all the things that were right with the book. And I didn't need that much detail. <laughs> but she's now working full time for a company in North Carolina, making all kinds of money. So knowing how to write a complete sentence does help your career. Okay. All right. I don't care how long they are. You can make a five lines. If you got what you got out of it, you get out of it, but be honest with it. Remember it's curiosity and tenacity. If you're doing the assignment, just get it over with, that's fine. But what happens is that habit creeps into your work life. And then guess what? You never get promoted. Why? Oh, you do shoddy work. Why? Because you get it done and it doesn't work. You do it again. It doesn't work. Do it again. It doesn't work. Because you didn't take the time to think through it. That's how you get good at this business. Is you just take time, think through it. Okay. Now, the project milestones and deadlines, that will come up once you get a project defined. And you get an idea of what you want to do. And to put this in a, in, a, uh, uh, in a quick thumbnail sketch is that if I'm a, the boss and I have a new uh, barn going up, I can tell where the barn is based on, okay, there's the foundation. There's the, uh, you know, I'm starting to see the walls go up, I'm starting to see the roof go in. Okay, I'm starting to see stuff go into the barn. Okay, I can see where I am in the project. In software, there is no equivalent. So the boss has no idea where you are in the project. So one of the important things to learn in software management and software or anything is that you build out milestones to let the boss know, hey, this is when the foundation is done. This is when the, uh, the two by fours go up. This is when the sheetrock goes on. This is when the roof finalizes. And you kind of put this in a progression so the boss can understand where you are in the project based on the milestones that you agreed on before the project started. Okay. More about that little rant later. Okay. All right. All right. Other questions? Fire away. I guess I could zoom in. Not that, not that you want to see my ugly mug. And the reason I wear a hat is that I'm really bald and uh, it glows too much. <laughs> so. Too many years in front of a computer, I've irradiated all my hair. How's that for an excuse? Is, it, is, that, is that true? <laughs> Let's hope not. Okay. All right. I have a question. Is that okay? Okay. Fire away. Um, I asked it in the chat, but it was a while back. So um, can we make something with the Arduino or is that too simple? Oh, no. Um, here's the thing with... Um, simple projects. I am not opposed to projects that <laughs> I personally perceive as, why would you want to do that? This is, this is so simple. Well, they've never done it. Okay. How much Arduino experience do you have? I, well, let me put it this way. I added it in. I've had quite a journey with this whole computer science thing and I honestly wanted to do more with my with my hands with computers does that make sense yes and now I, I got, and somehow I got sucked into programming so 
I took, I can't remember what it was, uh, the first few classes where you work with an Arduino and you have to do programming that goes with it and you make the lights do Morse code yep. and it was fun and goofy and I still have yep. that whole kit and I just thought, I don't know, maybe I could do something with that, but I wanted to check with you first to... Um, I have no no problem with that, and I understand the the tactile thing is last last year when I taught this, I had a group of three people, and that what they wanted to do is build a computer. Yeah, you know, really. I well, uh, and apparently that's know, too simple, and you don't get any money unless you are literally a what is it electrical engineer? Like you have right. to get a, to be an engineer to make serious money in that. Right. And then and the whole idea of building their own computer from from parts, they had never done anything like that before. So I said, yeah, sure. What'd you learn? Oh, we learned that firmware and drivers are very important. I mean, well, yep. Welcome to the world of hardware. Is <laughs> yeah, it's uh the one of the students uh, a few years back built a drone. And that yeah, was that was really interesting. That's and, pretty sick. And uh, they printed it on the 3D printer downstairs. So, you know, we do have access to 3D printers, but I don't know how we can do that COVID sense. But I'm sure we can figure something out, you know, because we do have access to that stuff. And we do have a lab aide that is still employed. He's just housed right now in the library. The magic lab where all the 3D printers are is basically closed for the time being. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't use a 3D printer if you know what you want to print. Um, but the world of computers and tangible, those days are slowly fading off unless you get into computer engineering where you're actually designing chips to do things yeah. like unfolding the, you know, like imagine the software that is in the new uh, telescope that's been deployed. <laughs> I can't even. And, Can and... you imagine the complexity of that software to do that sort of control from eight gazillion hundred million miles away? That's pretty amazing. You know, that's serious engineering, okay? And honestly, uh, it's too easy for anybody to get on uh, YouTube or Google or any of the sites or not even that, but the more professional sites and build their own machine. So, yeah, yeah. It's like, so that's that I it needs to look good in the portfolio. <laughs> and if you're just saying, hey, I implemented this content, I implemented WordPress. Well, yeah, you can do that with two mouse clicks on DigitalOcean too. Yeah. You know, what are you learning? Um, so it's it it's okay to drill down and say, hey, I want to provision my own Linux box. And if you are interested in setting up your own domain and your own web server running from your living room, I can show you how to do that. I oh, can... that I would like because I want to set up something that is completely unhackable and that if somebody tries to hack me, it traces back to them. But I think that might we could get in trouble maybe for talking about that. So, well, <laughs> step one, that's what I want. Yeah, that's, you know, so there's a goal. We would I want we... an impenetrable network because I've heard of virtual private. Net, like, that's not even enough. Like, you have to have like big servers and just yeah it's crazy so no there there's there's ways to do it there's there's linux distributions that are on cd only and you boot a cd well maybe that will be my final project yeah that's something that's very interesting and then how do you set it up to have port 80 and port 443 come to your house using dynamic see, here's here's my secret i have a roommate who has a master's degree in this very same thing but hers is network security so oh okay cool so you know so she could help you with things like um port forwarding bit, yeah. yeah yeah and, and configuring your router to do port forwarding dyna dynamic name service so you can have your um 
domain hosted at a DDYN place? And for nothing nefarious, just in case anybody out there is getting the wrong idea, I'm going to say that right now in the age of recording and, and all these things. This is strictly for... Oh, no. It looks, it looks so much better on your resume when you have your own domain rather than using GitHub Pages. Yeah, that was... GitHub Pages good. is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you have the entire stack working and you tell people, hey, this is how I got it working, that means you kind of know something. Yeah, that would be cool. Okay, I don't want to uh, monopolize the rest of the time. I'm sure other people have questions, so thank you. Um, you. You and I have seen each other for a minute now, especially with that whole nonsense of the incomplete. So thanks for that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, some specific examples. R2-D2 controlled by a cell phone and a Raspberry Pi that drove the motors and it went around the classroom with a camera and it was really cool. They, uh, it, it was because uh, the camera was mounted. They used this little, um, it looked like a tank and they gutted the tank and they put the camera on top and they kind of built an R2-D2 around it. And then the camera would show, and it was like, this is how the world looks from your cat. <laughs> and they learned a lot on that. They blew up about three or four Raspberry Pis because the schematics that they downloaded, they'd read it from one side, other side, and they had the board on the wrong side and they soldered to the wrong connectors and fried the board. So how do you learn that stuff unless you learn that stuff? Nice thing about raspberries are cheap, okay? Uh, it's not like you're, you're blowing up a $700 board. They're 35 bucks a piece, which isn't cheap, but I've got the Raspberry Pi 8 gig and I'm rather impressed. It works pretty well um, for anything I wanna throw at it, okay? All right. And let's see, another project is I had um, somebody write a game. This, uh, the same lady that is in the Jeremy video, she wrote a game. And what she did first was create the entire storyboard of the entire game with the characters and what the characters look like and how the characters interplayed. She wrote all that out first. And then the coding just kind of fell into place. I've had so I've had several game failures in this class because I want to write a game and they just start hacking away and they have no idea what they want their game to do. And then they realize, oops, they bit off more than they can chew. So step one to solve a problem is what are the edges to the problem? If you have a big wide open problem, you can't solve it. You can't eat an elephant in a day. So you need to take smaller chunks and find what you can work on within the span of a semester. There's some, uh, I've had I, there, a, a fun little uh, project that was at a hackathon is that this fellow took a cell phone and another cell phone and he used sound based off the accelerometer inside the cell phone. So it sounded like a lightsaber. Rawr, rawr. So you would have these battles with these invisible lightsabers using the phone. And it all went to the mothership they had set up in the cloud somewhere. And that was pretty trippy. Um, I've had folks, you know, there's these um, things that you put over your head and they will map your brain waves. Um, I've had people try to take that and do very simple controls like having a needle move to the left or the right based on brainwave patterns. Um, and again, you know, that's really interesting stuff, but then how do you get all the little pieces to work? You know, some of these things is that the project is in the big scope is not that complex, but all the little tiny pieces you need to connect makes it a little more complex than you thought, okay? Um, a lot of stuff with cameras, like the smart doorbell that you can get. 
How hard is it to make your own smart doorbell? You get a camera, you get a Raspberry Pi, and what do you want it to do? Okay. So that's, that's a, you know, there's, oh, geez. And I've had, um, I had one fellow said, hey, I need to learn more about databases. I said, okay, what do you want to do? He says, well, I need, I want to be more of a database admin. I said, okay, let's teach you how to spin up two Linux servers and two MySQL databases and run synchronization between master and slave of those two databases. Okay. So that was, that was a very, that project, um, you know, somebody that knows what they're doing can get that done in a day, but if you don't know how to set up a Linux box and you don't know how to set up a web server and you don't know how to set up MySQL, all those things take time to learn to be able to do that. Okay. So, and then creating your own content management system. I had some folks do a, uh, a menuing type thing for um, a little restaurant a family run restaurant, they had a little menu they set up and they, so they would have pictures and people would poke on it and it would send it back to the kitchen and they'd get what they'd ordered. Um, you know, you know, whatever you can think of uh, is, is game. The uh, had students say, Hey, I want to learn more about data science. I said, Oh, good. Let's learn about the Jupyter Notebook and data science. Do you want to use R or Python? Well, how about both? So we have to configure the Jupyter Notebook to use both programming languages and then start looking at data sets and then figuring out how to connect the data sets to make logical assumptions. Like for example, did you know the stock market has a tendency to go up when it's sunny in where the New York Stock Exchange is. And the stocks have a tendency to go down when it's all gloomy and sad weather. How do you find that? Well, you do patterns between the weather and the stock market moving up and down and you see these correlations. You can't find the causes but you can find the correlations and you can say, hey, you know what? maybe I can predict something. And then you can play some games. Uh, one student um, basically take a lot of stuff from the web and they assembled their own portfolio um, buy sell recommendation engine um, doing it. You know, they, they didn't do it for real because they didn't have that much cash to play with. And said, and, you know, by the end of the semester said, you know, if I had real money, I would have made $10,000. So, yeah, but that's when the market was going up. I don't know how it's doing when everything went down. <laughs> so, you know, you're going to learn one way or the other. So let's see. You know, like I want to learn a new technology. That's a good one. Uh, like for example, uh, I've, I've been given people this several times and nobody's figured it out yet. Given your virtualization platform of choice, let's call it VirtualBox, KVM, VMware player, create a network of five machines three of which boot over Pixie, the network boot stuff. That's not easy either. That's, that's quite the uptake because getting Pixie to boot to work is, you know, you look at a couple of helps online, but getting it to work in a virtual arena is a whole different picture. So how do you do that? Okay. I, my goal for the lab here is to get Vagrant and KVM figured out so I can have the machine boot to a boot screen and then they can pick the operating system that they want to run and then it will load it on the machine. And then when it goes away, poof, nothing is saved. 
so that it'd be all clean. So there's never any, any never any residual. Okay. Kind of like the guest account uh, that they used to have. Okay. Or I hacked a guest account in the 231 class. It mostly works. Okay. Uh, networking. I want to set up a network at home and I want to be able to do, you know, firewalls and port forwarding. I need to learn a Cisco router. I want to pass the Cisco certification. We have old Cisco equipment and you can use iOS. They do have an online simulator now that makes it much easier to learn that stuff, um, how to configure the switch. Again, it's all command line stuff. Knowing your Linux command line is very helpful. Um, building websites. I'll look through some of my notes and see, I'll find some more that come to the top. But the ones that the students had the most fun with is the robots, a robot that does something, you know, you know, motors or, you know, lights, cameras, action. <laughs> Those are the things that people had the most fun with. And they learned a lot in the process. I had one team build a complete retro pie. And I said, that might be a little easy until they had to wire it all together in a little box with all the wires together. They learned about wiring diagrams and they learned that, oh man, maybe this wasn't so easy because <laughs> they get to joystick and, you know, you had about like 30 games you can pick and getting all the controls to work off the control panel and wired into the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. That took a little more expertise than they had, but they learned, they learned. Like, for example, if you pick a project that requires soldering, let me know and I'll teach you how to solder. Because I did that for many years before I got into the software side of things. I would actually use digital logic probes to find a bad chip, remove the chip and replace it and solder it back on, okay? Those days are pretty much gone. You don't you don't do that much anymore. You just replace the whole board because it's cheaper uh, than, the, than the, the cost of the technician, okay? So I'll put together, uh, where's my little notes that I'll put here? Uh, examples of, Okay. So next week, I will give you the old hardware lecture. And that's mostly just for fun. Um, but trust me, <laughs> you're going to get a job somewhere, and they're going to have some old hardware. <laughs> and you're going to have to keep it working. Uh, when I was working at Foster Farms, I worked there from 97 to 2005. And uh, the oldest machine in the enterprise was in charge of printing all the payroll checks. <laughs> it was a Windows 95 machine that could not pass Y2K. <laughs> it was a miracle I could keep it running, but I knew a lot of little tricks on old hardware that kept it alive, so. Um, serial communications. Anybody, how do you use serial communications? You know, how do you communicate with a, a switch? You got a notebook and that's funny looking cable. How do you talk to it? Yeah, that's not hard. Just once somebody, um, it was Windows 98. Yeah, well, you have to remember, I've been around since about 81. So I was on the days of DOS 2.11, 2.1. And IBM DOS and CPM. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm a dinosaur, <laughs> but I try to keep up. It's still exciting. All right. Uh, if you miss the weekly meetings, uh, it depends on your group dynamics, if you have a group, 
but I will do my best to record every week, okay? Uh, there may be some weeks where this guest speaker says, no, I don't want you to record me. Then sorry, you're gonna miss out, okay? But I will try to find out ahead of time from the guest speakers it, what their bias is for that, okay? Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Fire away. What's your opinion on a text-to-speech program? Text-to-speech program. Like a custom text-to-speech. You know, I was just pondering that very same problem myself. Today, as a matter of fact. So I have a recording of a meeting that I attended several years ago, and I've never converted it to text. They, the festival, now I'm only speaking from a Linux background, mind you, okay? The open source stuff that I'm familiar with. There is a lot to be learned for implementing a text-to-speak engine on your own, but nobody will do that learning how to create an API that goes to the Google text-to-speech engine. Now that's a skill that you could probably sell because building out a text-to-speech, unless it has very specific points um, for like uh, language or something or accent or specifically customized to a person, it might have some legitimacy in the business arena, but the text to speech, like on my cell phone, I'm hard of hearing. I've got this option on the Android that says live text scribe. I click on it, somebody talks, and I can actually see the words on my cell phone. That's near real time translation. And it's remarkably good. So I would not try to reinvent the wheel. I would try to figure out how to write an API to send your stuff to it and send it back. Now, that being said, you could probably do it in two days, providing you know coding and you know what an API is, okay? And all that good stuff. You would record an MP3, send it to Google, and it comes back as a text. Now, here's a project I saw that was very interesting. They used Alexa and they used Alexa and a canned AI algorithm to monitor for depression. And then Alexa recommended giving or, or recommended this person to go um, uh, in for counseling or whatever. And this was done in a hackathon. Okay. Now the guys that did this particular project happened to be Alexa gods. Um, they were trying to get on at Amazon. So they wanted to do something that proved that they could work in the Alexa department. So they joined this hackathon and brought in their project and worked on it for 72 hours straight <laughs> and uh they got it they got it limping it was pretty impressive but text-to-speech is is it's fascinating and you can put it on your own box uh it's called the festival text-to-speech system um it doesn't take a lot of horsepower but you know it probably won't work on an old old notebook but if you have a, a relatively modern notebook or even an old tower with an actual sound card, it'll work fine. Mm, all right. All right. Can we make a website with multiple pages for our final project? I will need to talk to you about that. Because personally, you can do that in five minutes. It's not that hard to do that.
Okay. Now, if you start adding things like, hey, I want to use HTML5 and the canvas three tags, and I want to use some of this new HTML5 stuff and kind of write an HTML5 little simple game like Pong, that's a different story. Okay. But a website with three or four pages linked together, I can show you how to do that in five minutes. Okay. And uh, if you've never done it before, then that's a great way to get started. And then let's work on building out your web dev expertise and learning about cascading style sheets and more about JavaScript to make things interactive and the HTML5 tags, the canvas tag, which is amazing, um, and so on and so forth. So I don't want it to be so simple. Anybody can do it. The idea is you want to be able to build something that you can brag about that gets you a job or an interview. Make sense? Now, if you built a website from scratch and you built the Apache web server and you got your own domain and you put in the SSL, then that's starting to look more like a project, okay? Because I was playing with Sway the other day. And I said, oh my gosh, this is so easy. Um, but as a consequence, it, it lives on Microsoft servers and they give you analytics about your page which means they analyze what you're doing about what you're doing, which is what you get when it's free, right? You become the product. <laughs> All right. So Windows 98. Are there soldering irons to be loaned out to old dirty? Um, no, um, I don't have any, um, but this much I recommend is if you're going to solder, um, get the stuff that's cut uretic solder. That is the, the ratio between the tin and the lead is so when it cools, there's no, no chance of it turning into a cold solder joint. It's a little more expensive, um, but it's worth it. Rosin core uretic solder. I think it's spelled ER something. And um, use a, a small 15 watt soldering iron for things like the Raspberry Pi. You don't want these big monster soldering irons because you end up cooking the board. You want something small that has really precise heat. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a soldering iron that's used for plumbing. You know, it's, you know, about an inch and a half around you turn that thing on it'll melt anything <laughs> but it's it's for plumbing and copper and and acid-based solder you know it's not used for electronics all right but implementing something clever with text to speech something like turn on the lights turn off the lights where you talk to your house and you send a signal to the Raspberry Pi to turn a light on or light off. That would be interesting because now you're taking the API from, from Google or Festival to work off a few keywords to actually do something, unlock or open the garage door and have it open a garage door. Now in the way I would approach a topic like that is you get a Raspberry Pi and get it to respond to turn on the lights and have it turn on an LED. Okay. Get that working first and then build up uh, something else. Let me show you a project. Let me go back into my office and I will get you a project that I thought was kind of cool. I've had no takers on it.
All right. First things first, let me explain a little backstory here. Um, when you came to class, you saw some interesting music videos. One of them was Cognition Enhancer. I don't know if there's anything to that science or not, but it's interesting. I read a lot about neuroscience and I finished reading a book called Breath. Okay. And let me uh, explain a little bit about uh, what that is. You know, uh, meditation is a lot about breathing. You can put your body into a relaxed state by just extending your exhales. That's all you got to do. If you inhale for three, exhale for six, you're going to relax. It's just how your body works, providing you're normal, um, reasonably healthy. Okay. Now, what I've done is I've been playing. This is a website I've had since, geez, late 90s. I think it's this one. Yeah. All right. This is the perfect breath, according to the latest research, is you inhale and exhale for 5.5 seconds. Okay. Now, this is for an average person. Okay. The, you know, everybody's different and you kind of have to go through something. Now, I found this to be an interesting, now this would be a really interesting way to, now what's he doing here? Well, nothing fancy. This is just animation using a little bit of JavaScript and the HTML canvas tag, okay? Now, what if you took this same idea and let me stop the share and use something like this. Let me erase the board. And you got a Raspberry Pi and a motor that would take this. This is a bottle half filled with blue water and the other half filled with mineral oil. Okay. Now let me zoom in on that so it looks a little better. Uh -huh. I guess I am zoomed in. Okay. Oh, now you've probably seen these in stores. They are, uh, it looks like waves going back and forth. Okay. Now, wouldn't that be kind of fun to make a Raspberry Pi rotate this at 5.5 seconds with a little dial on it to turn it to say maybe six seconds, maybe 10 seconds, or say, let's say somebody's really stressed. Inhale for two, exhale for six, and have it rent. Mm -hmm. Kind of get the idea? It's just a, it'll be a fun thing to try. Okay. That's just one of many fun things you can do. Uh, all right. Raspberry pie with ice cream. I have to agree. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Now, do we have any more questions related to um, projects or such? Because if, you know, the, I had, you know, it was interesting. I had a, a fellow in my class a couple of years ago. And for the first, the, the team that they they put together or the top three students we've had in our AS program in a long time. This was several years back. And they just sit there, I couldn't come up with a problem. They, they couldn't come up with a, a project. He said, and then they realized why. He says, because all of them work professionally in the industry. All we do is solve problems. We don't create new interesting things. This is really hard for us. So what they ended up doing is they started off with this assembly line thing. And at the end, one of them had a, a gnarly business problem to solve. And so the three of them came up with this project that used a combination of private cloud, public cloud, AWS, database synchronization between SQLite and uh, uh, I think it was Postgres 
on their cloud server on AWS. No, it was the Amazon R RDBS, whatever their equivalent is. And they would sync it and they got it. It was completely amazing. And they did it in two weeks. So they started their entire project and then threw it out the door and then finished a really good project in two weeks. So this may happen halfway through the semester. This isn't gonna work. I need to start over. Remember, this is the place where you get to fail with impunity. <laughs> so that's okay. Because the, the goal is you're gonna learn, but I want you to have a brag tag. Don't cheat yourself of an opportunity to create something awesome. You know, you're not going to get a chance like this to actually dedicate time to do what you want that's truly creative and have a lot of fun with it. Okay. The, um, you know, you can do some fun stuff with music. Um, I don't know if you've seen, seen this. This runs on anything. I actually had a student do his final project with this. This is, whoops, let me screen the share, share the screen. I'm getting better at remembering uh, this one. Sonic Pi, uh, it comes on the Raspberry Pi, so you can actually play with it. It's used to teach programming. The, the guts that Sam Aaron used here, it's all written in Ruby. And what it does, is it lets you do some really fun things with music programmatically. So if you if you're into music, the guy that used this, he's a uh, he was a DJ. He would he had his full time job, he had his family, and he would DJ for weddings on the weekends. And what he did is he created a some tracks using the Raspberry Pi and this Sonic Net or Sonic Pi to weave together sounds that were similar as they were fading in and out of the music channel. So rather of one song, next song, it was one song, cool, funky music, next song. And then he would move it to something else, but it was all done programmatically. And he said, yeah, it was pretty cool. He, he could script a 20 minute session and he had his music that he already used and he just kind of scripted it all together. It was really pretty cool, okay? So this is fun. If you like making noise, this is a kick, okay? Uh, everybody who plays with it spends too much time with it. Um, let me turn on the sound. Connect. I don't know if this is gonna work or not. Probably not, because I'm virtualized here, and I'm doing some weird stuff with Zoom and the camera and the mic, so probably can't do it. But anyway, you can have some fun with this. Okay, yeah, there's the, yeah, that Sonic Pi, there's some really cool, there's some good demos on, on YouTube about it. Um, cause the guy who put it together was funded through the raspberry Pi foundation. And the goal was to teach students programming without them learning programming. In other words, make the sounds that you want it to sound like. So they learned how to code as a byproduct of getting their end result of the music they wanted to hear. Okay. I thought it was pretty clever. Okay. And I think we're pretty much right at the end of class here. Um, the other fun thing I had a student do is learn um, AI, specifically network programming or neural networks, and actually how to code up their own neural network. They use Java. And it was primitive, but they got it working. Now that's a piece of brag tag. That gets you a job, okay? So you wanna, wanna make it 
reasonably hard, but not impossible for you, and you want to make it so it looks really good, think about the job you want and then create a project that will help you get that job. Okay. Think of it as a continuum. All right. All right. Any more questions? All right. If not, I'll take that and I will stop for the day. And we will have, um, I will, once the recording stops, it'll get processed. <clears throat> And then I'll post it to YouTube and then I'll put the link on that continuing website and I'll put it in Canvas to let everybody know. I'll also post it in Slack. Okay. All right. If that's it, that's it. Thanks, Professor. Have a good evening. Hey, you too. Take it easy.